Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you for the Center for African Studies. Uh, I always believe that they have the best venue for conversation and putting some of the vital issues that at least related to uh, the dark nations and the global south at the table. I'm really uh, pleased to be here. And in the room, my co-author is sitting right there. It's Hussein Aizi. He's a PhD student and some other colleague from the Haas Institute. Um, so first of all, I just would like to share with you how the talk will look like today. Um, and I have to turn around sometimes. Uh, but I thought to, to put just in, in context why we did this report. And we go briefly through the major drivers for global force migration. And I will, uh, I will explain why we call it forced migration versus global migration <coughs> or immigration. Um, and also uh, because of the report is, is just cover a uh, huge array of issues that I'm not able to go through every single one of them. But to give a coherency, I would like just to suggest how the problem arise historically and contemporary very briefly. And, uh, and what, uh, what the reality of where those uh, displaced persons or refugees are located, despite the narrative that we have in a world that it seems in particular region. And lastly, we have modest policy intervention that we thought uh, it might contribute to re-envision a new regime for <coughs> refugee protections. Uh, first of all, I will start with the title and why we call it um, moving targets. We deeply believe that uh, the person who's been displaced as a refugee suffer the most dehumanization process in their homeland, in the country of transition, and when they settle, always being the target, even though they never choose to be a refugee or displaced person or asylum seeker. Um, and we thought that it seems uh, from our understanding as uh, investigators and researchers in this project that nation state in recent years, especially probably in the last 50 years or so, uh, used, uh, start to target citizen or non-citizen for their own political failures. You see that in countries that produce refugees or the countries that host refugees. So it's a, it's a hot commodity for both political elite in, in, in the uh, two sides of uh, the spectrum. But also before I start, I would like to, uh, uh, to share with you a, a trailer from uh, the Chinese director, Aviwe, uh, a new movie that uh, that he conducted in uh, almost 23 countries uh, around the globe to just to look at this massive scales of human displacement. The trailer is just about probably two and a half minutes. Being a refugee is much more than a political status. It is the most pervasive kind of cruelty that can be exercised against a human being. You are forcibly robbing this human being of all aspects that would make human life not just tolerable, but meaningful in many ways. The more immune you are to people's suffering, that's very, very dangerous. It's critical for us to maintain this humanity. الان شش روز با پسرم همینطوری داریم میچرخیم ولی هیچ کس نیستش که بگه یه راهی رو بخواد به ما نشون بده. کجا برم زندگی رو شروع کنم؟ If 
children grow up without any hope, without any prospects for the future, without any sense of them being able to make something out of their lives, then they will become very vulnerable to all sorts of exploitation, including radicalization. <laughs> The officials came here and told them, look, there's no way you're going to get papers to continue. Either you go voluntarily or we arrest you. I respect you. you know, I respect we, we, the, we the respect passport you. and I respect you. It's going to be a big challenge to recognize that the world is shrinking and people from different religions, different cultures, are going to have to learn to live with each other. When we start to think about these projects, uh, uh, We've been about six of us thinking through uh, this project since the beginning of 2016. Uh, myself and another colleague, she's not here, Nadia Barhoum, we went to Lebanon uh, to meet with some, uh, some of those refugees from different countries. Uh, and later, she traveled to Greece three times, conducted massive interviews just to see if there is hand people in Lesbos, in, uh, in Athens, and in, other, uh, in Saloniki, to see how they settle in. And always the outcome was really just uh, shocking all the time. Uh, the, the fundamental inquiry that we based our research on is we wanted it to humanize those massive amount of people. Because by dehumanizing refugees, we dehumanize ourselves. We don't do anything else. And it seems across the board that was the common denominator. Refugees being uh, accused of, being uh, blamed for, anything went wrong in our nations across the board. And that's whether that Africa or uh, Asia or, or, or uh, the most advanced economies in Europe, particularly Europe, uh, and in the United States as we see it unfolding uh, since last year. So, but it seems to us that in late 2015, particularly in December, uh, the targeted, uh, the tragedy of asylum seekers and refugees to European countries appear to reach the public consciousness, particularly after two incidents uh, that circulated widely in global media. One is the story of the boat that carrying about 2,000 uh, refugees, migrants, uh, from the shore of the African continent to Italy, sank in the Mediterranean, and about over 1,200 people died that day, or drowned. And the second was even more uh, terrifying to people, was the image of Ailan Kurdi, this kid, three years old. I refused to put that image that show him uh, out in the shore, but I rather to show his humanity <coughs> over here. And that's his brother was also drowned with their mother. Um, so it's it a bit those two incidents shock the European public consciousness and across the Atlantic in this side. But for us, from our research that we see that this crisis and tragedy been in the making for such a long time, but it was far away from our public consciousness. And that's uh, suggested to us why that was the case. Why we always ignore the <coughs> suffering of those people who, for many uh, uh, aspects, they did not choose to do so, or to take a risk uh, to travel in an unsafe boat, they might survive or not. When we looked at the condition uh, that they lived through, it was suggesting that they might also die while they are there. Uh, and those what we call the, the major drivers 
of uh, global force migration. And at the, uh, on the outset, I said I will explain why we call it forced migration, because it's not by choice. Uh, and I hope the people in the room, yes, we can agree on this premise, this context of these people are not choose to migrate. There is no options. And if any one of us, but under those circumstances, at least this from the interview I conducted, I asked them, like, <coughs> When in the hell you do that? How, how you, what you thinking? You cross all this by foot for three months. I met a guy in, in, in the UK, in London. He was telling me it takes him three months to cross from Sudan to come to London. And mostly, mostly, 80% of the time was on foot. And when he recounted the map and the countries, I just, I said, you are insane. Like, what's the purpose? He said, because if I stayed, I will be killed. I die, and at least to, to attempt to save myself in order to sustain my sanity and to help uh, uh, support my family. So the notion that immigrants, refugees, uh, they come in here to take what we have is the most absurd thing. Because one of the fairest conditions that the reason they left, because we took <laughs> what they have and make their life extremely unbearable. Not necessarily us as individuals, but we will see that uh, when, when we talk about those drivers. Uh, it might be harder for you to, to see this, but it's in a report. And uh, I will try to just mention a few. Uh, yeah, it's very hard to, to, to see. But, but one of the, after six months of looking at the research and the issues surrounding that why people move. So we start to create this diagram for us to understand why people move. So we come up with the thematic area first. We didn't look at the one in the left. And we try to figure out what the driver for each one of those, according to what we see unfolding in the world stage. So I can't even see it myself. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna use uh, at least this one, uh, if I can read it. Uh, but, but mainly was major drivers situated here, which include privatization and financialization and carbon-based economy and commodification of nature. All this exacerbated, facilitated by neoliberalism since 1970. Uh, we can if you really want to ask me anything, you can stop me and ask me what that means. Um, those, those kind of dynamic forces was unfolding, particularly in the global south country. And there's ample literature, that's not our claim, <coughs> but suggested today, for example, the World Bank, one of the creator of this model, in 2001 came to acknowledge that the social adjustment program was a complete failure and resemble all, almost colonial policy that inflicted in African countries. So that, that's, that's the creator of the institutions. But today we are not departed from that notion yet. We're still there. So this condition <coughs> created a lot of pressure on people, in, especially rural communities in the global south. But also government, even national governments that sincerely wanted it to do good in their own nation, they were unable to do because of the conditionality of the loan they uh, obtained from foreign uh, international institutions like uh, whether the World Bank or uh, uh, Monetary, uh, international, uh, Monetary International Fund, MF, uh, what is it? Uh, here we go. Um, IMF. So, so those conditions uh, paralyze those government of taking the own basic fundamental uh, way of life in those uh, countries. And every time will arise a new phenomena, one rises in the 2000, 2004 probably, uh, the massive land grab, which I will talk about a little bit down the road. But all these conditions, that the idea that we can have <coughs> infinite growth based on, on, on uh, uh, 
all in, in oil and extraction and uh, exploitation of natural resources and the natural world, we could sustain the world. And the disaster we inflicted upon our uh, environment and climate contributed to massive difficulties for those folks that make their life extremely unbearable. And the violent conflict, it wasn't one of uh, characteristic of those nations, but is outcome of scarcity of natural resources. So imagine a rural community that used to uh, raise their cattle or, or producing their own food, suddenly that piece of land shrinking, and it gets extremely hard for them to access water or arable land by whatever means, whether that natural means or uh, uh, expansion of land grab in their regions. So they will enter into a conflict with the neighboring community. Neighboring community might spill over another border or, or, or another region. So we see those internal conflict start to appear in the, in, in the interstate uh, stage. And suddenly, we have what manipulation that we see by the elite of those uh, places within a national government or otherwise to utilize or to manipulate uh, ethnic divisions or religion divisions or otherwise skin tone uh, in order uh, to keep people divided and to control what they wanted it to control at the end of the day. So, and, and by, just by that dynamic, immediately we will see policy of in inclusion, uh, exclusion start to appear in those countries. Maybe one of the most uh, ugly example we see in it today is what happening to the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. If, if, if you just look even deeper beneath the surface level of the conversation, it's not, of course they've been persecuted because they are different. But that wasn't the only reason why the Rohingya been uh, persecuted in Burma or in Myanmar. They located in you know, the most fertile land in that country. So they've been persecuted for such a long time by the elite of the Burmese state uh, to push them away from, 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 from that land. And, and, and in order to justify that, so they created or exploited the division between Buddhists and Muslims, and, and they deny their citizenship for such long period of time. This is not happening in the last year, but probably in the last century or so, that the Rohingya, Burmese, Myanmar, suffered a great deal of exclusion. Uh, and we see that in, in many other countries too. For example, the, the residents of the of, uh, Dominican Republic of Haitian descent that being pushed outside of the Dominican Republic to be relocated back to Haiti uh, two years ago. This is another example of denying citizenship based on how you look or where you come from. Even though these people uh, have their children born in that country. So, and you see that in Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa, and you see that in, in the one of the longest uh, conflict happening in Palestine, Israel, the way in which that occupation politics and practices of the Israeli state uh, inflicted upon uh, Palestinian people. So, wherever you look, you see this structural inclusion being put in place. Also, another, another element that neoliberalism really facilitates that credit uh, an elitist economy. That economy, uh, especially global, globalized economy that's benefited only the few. And this is not just true in the United States or Europe, but true everywhere. <coughs> but it seems it comes back here at the later stage. But that's the story of most of those places that are produced <coughs> more refugees. Uh, and then also, lastly, to tie it all this up, the whole uh, way of developing independent economies in those places or interchangeably with other nations is really not sustainable. It's by no means nowhere you can sustain this mode of production or this mode of uh, development plans. So always it will be a dead end, whether that in food, whether that in agriculture, whether that in trade, uh, or set up a, a, a service sectors uh, as a fundamental base for economy. So we see, we see that uh, manufacturing being completely abandoned uh, in, in <coughs> most economies, including uh, the United States. The devastation we see in rural and mid-America 
is the resulting of just demanufacturing all these places. So there is nothing. So again, elitists been able to reap the benefits of economic globalization. Majority of people left behind. And all this together create another sentiment, the xenophobia, the Islamophobia, all this ugly sentiment that we see to blame somebody else beside our failed political and economic project. But like I said it in the beginning, uh, forced migration have historical backgrounds and contemporary backgrounds. So I will mention three of each very briefly. So the history of accumulation and violence at Abir in most countries of the South, particularly the uh, African continent and uh, South America, the Caribbean and Asian uh, nations, wa was very foundational for the development of the economic prosperity of Europe and quote unquote the New World, whether that all settler colonial society, including Canada, United States, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and also including Japan. Uh, so that history also manifested around the idea of pushing, quote unquote, the native out of their uh, land. So this forced migration have that long, long history uh, weaved into the colonial uh, apparatus of the empires. But particularly the enslavement of African peoples, uh, it was, has a huge uh, setback on those society in the uh, African continent, and they have to bear that burden for many generations. I agree that colonialism died except one place or two, yet it is colonial mentality still reside and is still uh, uh, created uh, unfavorable condition for those society to, to, to move on. Uh, and the second piece of uh, uh, that historical context is World War II, uh, which many in this, in this country, we call it the good war that we fought against fascism and Nazism. Um, and indeed, people give uh, a lot of, of their life for to support just yes, a human society. Uh, and, and during that time, uh, within the context of migration and forced migration, uh, most nations, including United States and Europe, being guided by two particular principles, that morality and, uh, and political will to, uh, to help and assist and create a good condition for all people being forcibly uh, displaced for, uh, within Europe. Uh, during that time, probably around 60 million people being displaced and uh, forced out of their own uh, natural habitat uh, and their societies. So the, the international community, with the leadership of United States, Soviet Union, and other European countries, been, been able uh, to create certain protocols and agreements that assisted to create this humane uh, refugee protection regime. Uh, that includes the Universal Declaration of United Nations in 1948 and many uh, refugee conventions that followed after that year in 1951, 1954, and 1961, and also included 1967, the protocol related to the status of refugees. So all, all this uh, uh, consolidated uh, refugee regime was very humane in creating really good condition to absorb this tra tragedy that uh, the people in the move was in part of it is perpetuated again by their elite and their government for completely different reasons. Uh, but that's to suggest today when we look today, uh, which I will come back to it again, is what the difference between those conditions that allowed government to have the political will and morality to create a very appropriate uh, regime to protect the refugees and the displaced. But now we don't. What did change? In my, uh, as a researcher, I investigated this deep within the literature that available. It seems to me the, 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 the identity of the newcomers and the country of origins. These two fundamental things 
it became uh, uh, an issue for the European and United States and other society uh, that well enough. That's including countries in the south, like for example the Gulf Arab countries, uh, China, and Russia. All of them are not absorbing enough uh, according to their own mean and capacity uh, uh, that they have. Uh, so to suggest that, again, we're building those structural barrier within our own societies who will allow in and who is not, and who will consider even reaching that level of humanity, or uh, tomorrow might be uh, uh, a citizen or not. So all, all this structural barrier that it seems to uh, uh, been abandoned uh, or, or been recreated in the current status, but during World War II was completely, that wasn't the case. Uh, so the European refugees had possibility to resettle and to have a better uh, uh, outcomes. The one, uh, another historical element is during the Cold War, and particularly uh, uh, the race between United States and USSR. Um, so always, uh, if we look, this is stats from the State Department. So. We manipulated a little bit to figure out who is the majority of people coming in the United States since 1975. But it seems to follow the same pattern. When the United States have particular war in particular area, but also fighting, quote unquote, communism, uh, it seems people from those places will allow to come in. Uh, and by large numbers. Uh, we can see the largest, if you combine those two, will indicate that the Indochina war against Vietnam, Laos, and uh, 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 that region. And also, just even by association, you see a lot of people from the Caribbean, Latin America and the Caribbean indicated also uh, the people of Cuba. Uh, if United States hostile to the Cuban regime, will allow more Cuban to come and settle in. And you will see the African almost <coughs> the dark green. It was very few. Even though they experience same uh, uh, turmoils through the same uh, era, so that's to suggest that even set up the, the the regime of refugee protection during the Cold War, it was really for political utility. It has nothing to do with the morality and humanity and humanitarian intervention. But I'm not gonna say uh, that uh, United States and Europe always shut their door. Uh, in front of the people who need uh, protection. That's not true. That's not true at all. They did. But indeed, governments in, in very critical point been able to allow to pick and choose or to allow favorably uh, uh, people that are defectors from the socialist plot. So that's for them is another uh, ideological propaganda that we have people come from the, uh, the evil side to the more civilized side. So that's one of the main arguments during the Cold War. But again, I guess really what I would like to underscore is that does not mean that the same nations did not allow and accept uh, uh, refugee based on humanitarian grounds. But there is a manipulation on those numbers. Um, So going back to the contemporary uh, three major driver of global refugees, uh, in particular, there is many, but in particular one we touch upon is a structural adjustment program and its manifestation in the land grab. This is from Land Matrix, one of the only authority in the world that collecting data on uh, land being leased, sold, or grabbed by a uh, foreign entity, whether a government or a company, and the data is not related to the size, but at, to the location. So, till the time of this data, which till last week, uh, there is verified 220 million hectares being grabbed, leased, or taken from communities. 70% uh, of those are located in the African continent, and actually in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's to suggest if we look at the origin of today's migrants, even if there is no war, let's assume that, their livelihood 
the, the possibility that to settle in their own place, it became almost impossible. Majority of people in sub-Saharan Africa rely to agriculture related agricultural uh, sector. So where they will go, where they will move, how they can feed themselves. Uh, but that's not only just African continent, other places also being impacted uh, greatly. And there is many other uh, dynamic within this, but I thought this is the most obvious and people seems to just uh, forget about it while dealing with the refugee crisis. Um, and the second piece is, has to do with uh, securitization. Um, securitization, just to keep everybody in the same page, for us means a state's condition uh, of heightened security in the name of national security and national interest. And, it, and, it, and the, the state's need strategically to manage expulsion, deportation, resource and power conflicts, and citizenship rights. So it seems in, in, in the few past decades of neoliberalism that there is, especially particularly after 9-11, this war in terror became so uh, prevalent all over the world. So uh, in Ethiopia, when they try to fight against a land defender, they uh, uh, legislated uh, a terrorism law. So imagine that if uh, a rural uh, activist tried to defend his or her community, and actually there is a case in court, and the activist being tried and sent to 15 years in jail in Ethiopia, because they just defend the right for against land grab. So they use even that as a law of terror. Uh, persecution of minority group fall under the same thing. Even though this is created uh, by United States for obvious reasons, but it seems the proliferation of this uh, span around the globe. And now we are almost nil we're talking about state terrorism, but we talk about how the state wants to protect itself from uh, terrorism, whether internal enemy or external enemy. And it seems most of the time is bogus and unfounded uh, exacerbation of fear of, of our national interest uh, uh, and, and uh, a nation being at jeopardy. So, so we see this in, 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 in many places from Afghanistan to Colombia to the Democratic Republic of Congo, Iraq, Myanmar, Palestine, South Sudan, Syria, Yemen, and the list goes on and on and on. If you look at every single country of those and we looked at them, we find there is a war in terror going on somewhere and especially claimed by the state, have nothing to do with the people who have been inflicted upon them. And those type of wars produce the majority of people being displaced today. So when you count again, the people who've been uh, in the move, you find them from this country that I mentioned primarily. So there is a, a quiet relationship between this idea of securitization or patriotism or war and terror or, or secure, securing our border or national interest or geopolitical interest vis-a-vis -vis the uh, forced migration phenomena. So both of them link together because without the fair, the, the, the displaced person, their number, they might be the same number, I'm not quite sure, but definitely not going to be because of uh, instability. It might be because of other issues related to uh, 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 economics instability or climate crisis. Um, uh, the third element is uh, climate crisis. Uh, as we all know that most of the nations suffered greatly and uh, uh, became extremely vulnerable to environmental change and climate crisis, our country most, more or less are, have nothing to do with uh, creating uh, the problem in itself. I should wrap it up. <laughs> uh, uh, so our idea is to look at the most, uh, 10 most 10 countries that uh, uh, polluted our, uh, or contributed to the emission of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I mean, there is many argument we can talk about how a uh, climate crisis uh, come to exist, but this is one of the elements that we have data to suggest that who contributing more and uh, in reality and how other people suffer the greatest turmoil. 
So most of vulnerable countries are located in the global south or uh, small nation states. That they are, there is no way for them to protect themselves from uh, climate, uh, from the vulnerability uh, in their geographical location. And, and, and the climate crisis itself created, as I stated in the beginning, massive displacement as well. Uh, ripe condition for livelihood in most of the uh, nation of the global south rely on agricultural production or uh, uh, food production. All this became extremely tight, extremely uh, 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 vulnerable sector and abandoned by the policy of structural yes bomb programs that defunded all mega structure in agriculture sector and rural communities. So the two collide economic uh, plans that are failing plus climate crisis that exacerbating the livelihood uh, of people to stay in their uh, homeland. I got to move quickly. Here became the, the major question that related to the title of the talk. Is this a European refugee crisis or really is a humanity crisis? Any three clicks of research, you will find out that Europe does not, even Global North as a whole, does not host more than 16% of over 65, 63.5 million people, does not according to what registered through international agencies. So why is the fuss about it? And that's a critical question. The Global South country hosting the majority of these people, almost 84% of the 60 million people. And, and you will be shocked to see even countries that are extremely vulnerable, extremely vulnerable, like Lebanon. In H5, Lebanese, one of them is a refugee. It's unbelievable, a country that suffered from own instability, but yet been uh, able to force absorb 20% uh, of its size of its population as refugees. Do they do a good job? Uh, that's questionable. But at least they didn't shut the door. And they are the, have the capacity to shut the door, but they don't. Other countries that have the capacity in the region, like Saudi Arabia, do they do that? No. They launch war against a vulnerable country? Yes, they do that. They do that with the protection, with superpower and European liberal democracy as well. So it's a very questionable our, about our humanity and how we continue to shut in door uh, in, in the face of this massive human tragedy. Uh, if we look vis-a-vis uh, 100% of inhabitants, again, we see the same uh, country of the South, maybe with the exception of Sweden, uh, who is a major country that hosts refugees. In the report, there is a detailed uh, narrative about that and country. Uh, you can download it online as well, both of these infographs. Um, but this is, again, uh, it shows our, uh, we lack the political will and morality vis-a-vis -vis the international uh, law, of, or humanitarian international law, and uh, the way in which we think about the protection, providing protection for the most vulnerable uh, uh, among our uh, fellow human. Our inability to be able uh, to create uh, a coherent and coordinated effort to absorb this tragedy is far removed from, from our uh, leader's agenda. It has nothing to do, there is no one country can absorb this massive human movement. And, and anybody has any logic cannot ask any country, Germany or otherwise, no one can do that. But this is, it comes in one of our uh, uh, idea of uh, further suggestions to it. But the most uh, uh, critical piece of this is, we believe that is, this is a really European uh, 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 crisis. And I think I misplaced some of uh, uh, the uh, slides. And instead of going further with thinking through coordinated effort and policy in the EU or European nation, the 28 country of the EU, it seems Europe going to build massive borders and fences within their own nations, even though they are the European Union that diminishing the, the national border for, uh, uh, for their citizens. So it's very contradictory in nature. Um, and there is many claims by almost neo-fascist leader in the world stage, like in Hungary or Poland, that we are here to defend the Christianity of Europe against this infiltrator. 
uh, is, is insane. I mean, it's publicly stated and publicly debated. It brought the European Parliament. So it's not, uh, uh, I'm not suggesting or accusing, but this is the reality and facts. And, 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 and that's another piece of this massive human tragedy. What can take us to where? When we start to blame the newcomer and building all these fences, uh, and this is an old data from the Washington Post. But if I look today, maybe it will be more fences that's been in the, uh, uh, either already built or they try to build it in more than 10 countries in Europe. So fencing Europe is not, uh, uh, is not far away from our uh, framework of analysis that's uh, forced migrants uh, being treated as a political utility for an internal crisis, whether that for European Union institutions, whether that uh, after the financial meltdown and the Greek uh, uh, crisis or Brexit or whose exit, I don't know, or who's staying in Europe. Uh, but in dealing with the hardcore question of economic prosperity and wealth sharing in Europe, that it seems there's a deviation to blame somebody else and, to, and, and we see the rise of nationalist movement that really reminded us of the condition of pre-World War II. So it's, it's not a scary tactic, but it seems, uh, I, I hate to say this, but historical condition repeats itself in some places, including our own nation. So we need to be cautious on that front. So I will go quickly, so to wrap it up, uh, uh, to allow time for your uh, comment and feedback and suggestions. Uh, it seems to us this kind of a human tragedy is insolvable by one actor or one nation or one body. Uh, so we believe from community level to interstate level and global level, it need to be a, a re-coordinated effort to just to do that. But the fundamental issue we think that we need really to reassess the whole entire refugee protection regime. What we created in the 1950s and early 60s, it doesn't seem responsive enough, capable enough of dealing with this new human tragedy. We need to figure it out. Uh, there is no uh, uh, magic solution here, but there is, if there is will and there is morality standards, we could come up with a coherent way in which to look at how we could create a, a, a ripe, appropriate, global uh, refugee to protect uh, the most vulnerable among us. And that could include something we are not doing it at the moment. For example, in, in countries that in the global south they host the most vulnerable, we could provide robust assistance and technical expertise. So for people not to have to cross and to go through hell in order to reach European shore or United <coughs> States or Canada or Australia, but they could be there, but in a humane condition, not the condition that the European Union now providing like building refugee camps, just like a concentration camps in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's unbelievable to, to hinder <coughs> refugee from reaching the uh, Libya or, or to get to the shore of Italy. This is not humane or a smart way of doing things. You, you cannot do that. Uh, that only increased human trafficking, abusing of, of, of fellow humans, the, the, the reports come out of Libya and how uh, the people go through Libya is, is just beyond belief uh, when you hear testimony from people go through that hell. So, but that's what we have in the table right now. European Union bribing African countries to set up those kind of concentration camps in order not to see the tragedy of uh, forced migrants. We need really to think deep onto that. But, I'm not going to list all of them, but will be available for you if you would like. We'll share the PowerPoint with you, and the report also have the suggestions very well explained. But one of the most important pieces of it, we really need to think about the, the debt regime that really shackle most of those countries in any way or shape or form to be able to move on in a sustainable, uh, appropriate development plan. So if we don't do that, at the same time, uh, thinking about uh, new refugee regimes, I think we are just uh, circling back in the same position. So we are not gonna get out of it. And similarly, 
we need to increase collaboration between uh, the private sector, NGO sector, humanitarian organization, state, locality, and international agencies. And in particular, we think that refugees themselves have to have some representation in the matter. Uh, uh, my colleague, when she went to uh, uh, Greece uh, last summer, one of the hurdles is most refugees in that particular camp, uh, all of them spoke Arabic. Most of the aid organization, they coming from Europe. There is no way even understanding what the, those people, their fear are or their condition or what they need. And culturally inappropriate conversation, it traumatized them even more. So, so even set up just that kind of uh, uh, capacity building, refugees themselves could be uh, help uh, to, to, to have some kind of capacity in order to uh, help other refugees as well. And the more we in include them in this kind of thinking about solution, uh, this is not uh, imaginary things. I work with group of refugees in Beirut, Lebanon. They create their own foundation and they're helping their own refugees. It's unbelievable their tenacity, their courageous, the, they don't even want funding from large uh, uh, philanthropy. They want just to do uh, the basic fundamental things like education, you know, uh, knowing the laws in, in that particular place. They do that. And there's many uh, refugee organizations doing that, run by uh, refugees themselves. So with that, I will leave it here and I will welcome any comment, uh, feedback or question you want. Thank you. Thank you.